and welcome to our September Geography Matters. Tonight we'll be hearing from Craig Thornton and Alison Specht. They'll be discussing Australia's oldest continuing paired catchment study in the Brigalow Belt bioregion. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting this evening. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Before we get started, a quick mention of upcoming events. We do have several in the calendar as always. Please do check the RGSQ website to register and see what we have coming up. Of key highlight though is our expert panel and public forum together with the Royal Society of Queensland looking at fire in the landscape coming up on Friday the 20th of September. Also this month is our RGSQ photography competition looking at geographic icons of Queensland. Get your pictures in quick with that competition closing on the 30th of September. Rolling into October, we have two events already in the calendar. What does a disaster management geographer do in the Queensland Government? Our monthly lecture on Tuesday, the 1st of October. And this time next month for our next Geography Matters, we have Changing the World Through Reef Conversations. Check the website, register now, so you don't miss out on these upcoming events. Tonight, we have two fantastic speakers to talk through this fascinating topic. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Craig Thornton, who's a senior scientist with the Department of Environment and Science and is the project leader for the long-term Brigalow catchment study. He's passionate about understanding the effects of land clearing and land use change on the natural resources of the Brigalow Belt bioregion. This knowledge guides agricultural best management practice towards long-term sustainability. Our interviewer for this evening is Alison Specht, who completed her doctorate at the University of Queensland and worked for many years as an environmental science academic at Southern Cross University. She left the university in late 2009 to take up one of the first positions at the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network, or TERN, where she established the first ecological synthesis centre in the Southern Hemisphere. It was through that that she and Craig first became acquainted. She then went to France, where she held the position of director of the Synthesis Centre there, returning back to Australia in 2019. She's developed considerable expertise in research data management, most particularly developing ways to help researchers and research teams engage in open science. She's published many scientific articles on Australian vegetation and on the analysis and synthesis of environmental data. Without further ado, Craig, take it away. Good evening, everyone. I'm Craig Thornton, and it's my pleasure to talk to you about the Brigalow Catchment Study. I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Amanda Elledge, and the Queensland and Australian governments for funding the study. In the 1960s, a team of visionary Queensland government researchers established the Brigalow Catchment Study to assess the productivity and sustainability of agricultural systems following broad-scale land clearing in the Brigalow Belt bioregion. The study continues today, six decades later, and I'd like to share some of its key findings with you. The Brigalow Belt bioregion, shown in yellow, is an area of nearly 37 million hectares on the eastern edge of the Australian rangelands, the Black Hatching. The Brigalow catchment study is the red star in the heart of the Brigalow Belt. The Brigalow Belt is characterised by Acacia harpophylla, or Brigalow, a leguminous wattle tree growing to 10 to 15 metres. Brigalow is typically found on highly fertile cracking and non-cracking clay soils. The first European to traverse the Brigalow Belt was Leichhardt in 1844. The impenetrable and unrelenting Brigalow scrub is depicted in this sketch from his diary. Settlement followed within two decades, no doubt encouraged by Leichhardt's description of fine plains, having the black soil, the vegetation, the dry creeks and watercourses of the Darling Downs, all of which would form a most excellent cattle station. Early settlement in the Brigalow Belt had its challenges including the explosion of prickly pear from 1880 to 1934. Prickly pear infested about 12 million hectares, more than half of the southern Brigalow Belt. In some instances, settlers simply abandoned their properties. But with the introduction of the Cactoblastis moth in the 1920s and the most successful biological plant control program ever seen, prickly pear was overcome. By the mid-1930s, settlers were once again developing the Brigalow Belt for agriculture. Agriculture expanded rapidly with the adoption of mechanised clearing. In 1962, the Brigalow Land Development Fitzroy Basin Scheme commenced. This scheme involved government-sponsored clearing of 4.5 million hectares of land for agriculture, primarily as a closer settlement, employment and development initiative post-World War II. 
Under the Fitzroy Basin Scheme, leasehold land was made available for development via a ballot process with the provision of finance by the government. <clears throat> Freehold land was made available via auction. Applicants had to meet eligibility criteria, including being male, between the age of 18 and 55, with three decades of pastoral or farming experience in the last decade, and must possess $24,000 in cash, livestock, or readily convertible assets. This is equivalent to about $250,000 in today's currency. Development conditions also applied. 6,000 acres of scrub was to be cleared. A cattle dip and yards had to be constructed within the first year, the boundary fenced within two years, and internal fencing and watering points completed within three years. Again, the red star on the main map indicates the Brigalow catchment study at the centre of the Brigalow bo blocks available for purchase by the second auction of the Fitzroy Basin Scheme. The auction of these five undeveloped blocks yielded $367,066, which is equivalent to just over $3.8 million in today's currency. The current value of the five fully developed grazing properties is about $118 million. In order to determine the impact of the Fitzroy Basin Scheme on hydrology, soil fertility and crop and animal productivity, the Brigalow Catchment Study started in 1965. The study site is located on Wadja Country within the Fitzroy Basin, the blue outline, with the scheme area shown in dark grey and the Brigalow Belt in light grey. The photo shows the native Brigalow vegetation of the bioregion in its virgin condition, although this particular patch isn't quite as thick as that sketched in Leichhardt's diary. The study is a paired calibrated catchment design, consisting of three catchments of 12 to 17 hectares with predominantly clay soils, black and grey vertisols, all with native vegetation of virgin brigalow scrub. The study received summer, summer dominant rainfall of approximately 650 millimetres per year. In this aerial image taken in the mid 1960s, access tracks bordering the three catchments, one, two, and three, can be seen through the vegetation which is indicative of the landscape in its pre-European condition. You can see patches of quite thick scrub, indicative of that which Leichhardt struggled through only 70 kilometres to the west in 1844. The bare patches show the location of monitoring infrastructure. During stage one of the study, all catchments were instrumented to monitor rainfall and runoff. Here we can see a flume being installed to collect runoff data to develop an empirical calibration between the catchments. Water flows through the flume, we measure the depth, and the engineered design of the flume allows us to calculate flow based on depth. The catchments were monitored in their virgin state for 17 years. Permanent monitoring sites were established in each catchment during this time, with baseline measurements of soil fertility taken in 1981. This figure shows the hydrological results of the 17-year calibration phase. The x-axis shows the measured runoff from catchment one, while the y-axis are the measured runoff from catchments two and three. As you can see, the catchments were good hydrological pairs, and using these relationships, it is possible to estimate the runoff from catchments two and three using the observed runoff from catchment one. Stage two of the study commenced in 1982, with two of the three catchments cleared. Scrub was pulled with two bulldozers, joined by cable and chain. This was the traditional method of land clearing at the time. After pulling, the timber was burnt in situ, as these photos indicate. After burning, catchment two was developed for cropping with the construction of contour banks and grass waterways. Catchment three was developed for grazing with the sowing of buffalo grass and improved pasture species. Stage three of the study commenced in catchment two in 1984 with the planting of grain sorghum, while grazing commenced in catchment three in 1983 typically with Brahmin and Brahmin cross cattle. No fertiliser or feed supplements were used in either catchment. This is the Brigalow catchment study as it looks today. The Brigalow scrub control catchment sits within a remnant of virgin Brigalow scrub. Adjacent to it, the catchment developed for cropping and the catchment developed for grazing, both located within larger paddocks of the same land use. So what are the impacts of land use change on hydrology? The key finding is, that there are similar changes in runoff, but significantly different drainage depending on land use. And the picture on screen shows water running off a catchment through a flume on the left-hand side of the image. 
In this figure, the blue bars indicate the measured annual average runoff from the three catchments. The dotted lines are estimates of the runoff from catchments two and three using calibration equations developed during stage one. As you can see, clearing Brigalow has more than doubled runoff. This figure shows the movement of soil chloride under the three catchments as a result of drainage. It's chloride that is responsible for the dry land salinity issues that we often see associated with the Murray River in Southern Australia. The chloride profiles of all catchments were similar pre-clearing. No changes in soil chloride were found under Brigalow over the next 20 years, as shown in the graph on the left. However, the catchments being developed for cropping and grazing showed a significant amount of chloride loss immediately post-clearing. The centre graph shows that over the next 16 years, chloride loss under cropping continued, with deep drainage averaging 20 millimetres per year. The graph on the right shows that unlike cropping, soil chloride loss doesn't continue over time under pasture, with deep drainage averaging less than one millimetre per year, about the same as the Brigalow catchment. So what are the impacts of land use change on soil fertility? The key finding is that there are significantly different soil nutrient dynamics depending on land use. In the following figures, the Brigalow catchment is always shown in black, the cropping catchment in red, and the pasture catchment in blue. Focusing on soil organic carbon, the black line shows organic carbon in the Brigalow catchment, which has remained unchanged over time. The red line shows that organic carbon in the cropping catchment has halved, while a blue line shows that organic carbon in the pasture catchment has generally remained constant. However, only 60% of the organic carbon under pasture is derived from the original Brigalow vegetation, with the remainder derived from buffalo grass. This suggests that a poorly managed overgrazed pasture would also lead to a decline in soil organic carbon. Focusing on soil nitrogen, the black line shows total nitrogen in the Brigalow catchment, which has remained unchanged. The red line shows total nitrogen in the cropping catchment has more than halved, but with the planting of leguminous crops and extreme rainfall, the decline trend may be reversing as shown by the last data point. The blue line shows that to total nitrogen in the pasture catchment has nearly halved and in the absence of a legume in the pasture continues to decline. Focusing on soil available phosphorus. The black line shows bicarbonate extractable soil phosphorus in the Brigalow catchment, which has remained generally unchanged. The red and blue lines show the substantial increase in available soil phosphorus in the agricultural catchments immediately after burning as a result of ash deposition. From that point, available phosphorus in both catchments declines to pre-clearing or less than pre-clearing concentrations. And what are the impacts of land use change on water quality? The key finding is, but it depends on hydrology, soil fertility, and land use. These are the water quality loads from 2011, the wettest year in the nearly 60 year study history. Substantial loads of nitrogen species, phosphorus species, and suspended solids were lost from all three catchments. The Brigalow catchment, having leguminous vegetation and the highest soil nitrogen, had the greatest nitrogen runoff loads, while the greatest phosphorus and suspended solids loads were from cropping, as a result of it having the lowest cover and hence more bare soil. These are the water quality loads from 2016, a dry year and the 29th rainfall percentile. Substantial loads of nitrogen, phosphorus and suspended solids were lost from the cropping and pasture catchments. However, unlike 2011, the Brigalow catchment, which averages only half the runoff, didn't run off at all. Hence, all the runoff nutrient loads from the cropping and pasture catchments in this year were an anthropogenic increase totally attributable to land use change. This figure shows the long-term cumulative impacts of land use change on water quality. The top figure shows that since clearing, total nitrogen lost in runoff from cropping, the red line, is greater than that lost from Brigalow, the black line, while nitrogen lost from pasture, the blue line, is lowest. The bottom figure shows that since clearing, the suspended solids lost in runoff from cropping greatly exceed that of Brigalow, while suspended solids lost from pasture is only a small increase. These slides have shown decades of data but they don't provide insight into the actual management of the study itself, which has evolved over time. Decisions on management change were not made in isolation. Throughout the mid to late 2000s, the study was reviewed heavily to ensure that the research questions were still valid and the outputs relevant to both science and industry needs, with complementary studies added to the core data collection from the long-term catchments. 
This was the era of the first reef water quality protection plan and the first scientific consensus statement on water quality in the Great Barrier Reef. But what has the Brigalow Belt bioregion and Australia's eastern rangelands got to do with the Great Barrier Reef? Well, the rangelands, including the tropical savannas and the Brigalow Belt, all intersect with the 423,000 square kilometre Great Barrier Reef catchment area highlighted in blue. These regions have many things in common. Firstly, the dominant land use in all of them is grazing. Secondly, they all suffer from runoff induced soil erosion. And thirdly, areas of each of them drain directly to the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. And according to the 2017 scientific consensus statement, key Great Barrier Reef ecosystems continue to be in poor condition. This is largely due to the collective impact of terrestrial runoff associated with past and ongoing catchment development, coastal development activities, extreme weather events and climate change impacts. Let's unpack the linkage between grazing in the rangelands of the Brigalow Belt and Great Barrier Reef water quality. To do that, we focus on the comment about past and ongoing catchment development. This is a reminder of what past and ongoing catchment development looks like for the grazing industry in the Brigalow Belt and in other Queensland rangelands in Great Barrier Reef catchments. This is scrub pulling with cable and chain. And in some instances, we simply drove over the trees with a Latorno tree crusher. Land clearing in Queensland's rangelands has continued for decades. From 1996 to 2006, rates of land clearing were among the highest in the world. More than 60% of this clearing occurred within the Brigalow Belt, which includes 98% of the Fitzroy Basin and 46% of the Burdekin Basin, which collectively account for about 80% of grazed land in the Great Barrier Reef catchment. The Brigalow catchment study has clearly demonstrated the effects of land clearing and land development on hydrology and water quality. What the study couldn't tell us was the effect of specific grazing land management practices on water quality. We wanted to know, could improving gra grazing management increase pasture biomass and ground cover, leading to improvements in water quality? In practical terms, is it reasonable to expect better water quality from the conservatively grazed pasture on the right compared to the heavily grazed pasture on the left? From 2014, a complementary study was added to the long-term Brigalow catchment study to answer this question. The Brigalow scrub control catchment and the long-term conservatively grazed catchment were complemented by the addition of a heavily grazed pasture in a catchment adjacent to the long-term study. During this time, the conservatively grazed catchment was stocked at or below the safe long-term carrying capacity of the aged rundown pasture, or about one adult equivalent beef animal per three and a half hectares. However, the heavily grazed pasture was stocked at about one adult equivalent per two hectares, which was the recommended stocking rate for newly established buffalo grass pastures on recently cleared Brigalow land. This stocking rate made no allowance for decline in pasture productivity since clearing. This is the long-term rainfall record for the catchment study. The blue bars show how much annual average rainfall was above the long-term average, while the orange bars show how much rainfall was below the long-term average. This grazing management study commenced in 2014, the red arrow, and was followed by seven years of below average rainfall. This is the equal longest run of below average rainfall years in the silo record since 1890. The previous run of seven below average years being the Federation drought, which totaled an extra 100 millimetres of rainfall than the recent drought. So we compared the effects of two different stocking rates on catchment hydrology and water quality in perhaps the driest period in European history. What did we find? The first thing we found was that this is what it looks like when you don't reduce stocking rates on rundown pastures to match safe long-term carrying capacity. In a heavy grazing catchment, cover was less than 50% and biomass was less than 1,000 kilograms per hectare. This does not meet the minimum practice agricultural standards for beef cattle grazing as per the Queensland Government's Reef Protection Regulation. What else did we find? In this figure, the bars show the average annual runoff from the three catchments. Comparison of runoff from the conservatively grazed pasture centre with runoff from the heavily grazed pasture on the right shows that overgrazing pasture further increases runoff well above that attributable to land clearing and development alone. Overgrazing resulted in more than three times the runoff from conservative grazing. This is in addition to the doubling of runoff as a result of land clearing and development as shown by comparison with the control catchment of virgin brigalow scrub on the left. 
In this figure, the bars show the average annual total suspended solids loads whilst in runoff from the three catchments. Again, a very similar story. Overgrazing resulted in an additional 30% more suspended solids lost in runoff than conservative grazing. In the first four years of this study, overgrazing resulted in three times more suspended solids lost in runoff than conservative grazing. And as before, this is in addition to the more than tripling of suspended solids lost in runoff as a result of land clearing and development. In this figure, the bars show loads of nutrients lost in runoff from the three catchments. On the left is total nitrogen and its species, while on the right is total phosphorus and its species. While overgrazing again resulted in more nitrogen lost in runoff than conservative grazing, both pastures lost less nitrogen than virgin brigalow scrub. This is because brigalow is a legume, fixes nitrogen, and maintains high soil nitrogen concentrations unlike the pasture catchments, which have both suffered significant soil nitrogen decline after decades of grazing. Unlike nitrogen, Phosphorus losses show the same dynamics as runoff and suspended solids. Overgrazing lost nearly 80% more phosphorus in runoff than conservative grazing, which lost about 70% more phosphorus than brigalow scrub. So what do we do with all this information? As scientists, policymakers, and landholders, why are we still interested in the effects of land development in the brigalow belt? Firstly, because this is the northern grain zone, the most productive broadacre farming land in Australia, including the Liverpool Plains, the Darling Downs and the Peak Downs. And secondly, because the Fitzroy Basin alone is home to 2.6 million cattle. This is the largest cattle herd in any natural resource management region in Australia, accounting for 25% of the state herd and 11% of the national herd. And thirdly, because achieving these things has come at a substantial environmental cost. When the Vegetation Management Act 1999 was introduced, 93% of acacia harper filler woodland had been cleared. The particular photo of the land type on screen is brigalow with melon holes. Melon holes referring to the water-filled gilgais that form on vertisol soils. The light green shading shows the pre-European brigalow extent in Queensland, and the dark green shows the 7% that is left today. Clearing brigalow for cropping or grazing has doubled runoff clearing double peak runoff rate under cropping and increased it by 50% under grazing. Clearing increased total suspended solids loads by 600% under cropping and 80% under grazing. Soil fertility and crop and pasture productivity have declined over time. Overgrazing has exacerbated these results, tripling runoff, peak runoff rate and total suspended solids loads compared with conservatively grazed pasture. All of this occurs within Queensland's largest coastal catchment, which continues to be in poor condition. So what's being done about it? Under Reef Plan, using policy driven by best available science, work to decrease land-based runoff in the reef's waters is now well advanced. Significant efforts have been made to implement improved land management practices throughout reef catchments in order to decrease the flow of nitrogen, pesticides and sediments to the reef. So how are we going? We're going slowly. Results show progress in some areas, However, faster uptake of improved land management practices is required to meet the water quality targets. This figure from the Reef Water Quality Report Card 2020 shows that across all reef catchments, the modelling suggests a 15% reduction in sediment loads to the Great Barrier Reef, so reasonable progress towards a target of a 25% reduction. However, within the Fitzroy Basin, the modelling suggests a reduction of only 10%. In conclusion, I believe this 60 year long multidisciplinary study clearly shows the impact of land use change and land management on hydrology, soil fertility, water quality and animal productivity. It provides a number of metrics by which we can assess sustainability both on and off site. The long term data records can be considered a model in their own right and are capable of answering questions well beyond the initial scope of the study. The continuation of the study today allows researchers to answer new questions not thought of or not of concern when it commenced nearly six decades ago. I acknowledge the questions we wish to answer will differ, but if the Brigalow Catchment Study can assist you with your question, I invite you to join with the study via our online data portal. Here you can access additional information about the study and its publications, but perhaps most interestingly, you can view real-time data from the catchments. Here we see a snapshot from October 2018 when 141 millimetres of rainfall generated 49 millimetres of runoff from the heavily grazed catchment. Please visit us soon.
And thank you for your attendance. And at this point, I would like to welcome any questions. Well, we have a couple of um, comments in the in the in the chat that require some some answers. So, Craig, I think your best place to answer the Robin Cowley's comment for, for a start, certainly. What are the target pasture utilisations for conservative versus heavily grazed? Uh, our thresholds for conservatively grazing is always greater than 1,000 kilograms per hectare of biomass. Um, that results in a cover level, I don't think it's ever been lower than about 83, 85%. Um, interestingly enough, in the heavy grazing catchment, we find that our cover levels haven't dropped dramatically with our drop in biomass because we've had a pasture species composition switch and our um, buffalo grass and purple pigeon grass, our 3P perennial, perennial, palatable and persistent grasses have been grazed out and they have been replaced by Indian cooch. So that catchment now looks a lot like a lawn and that's yeah. going to be something I'm going to talk about at the Rangelands Conference next year. Ah, we got it in. Um, <laughs> this um, That brings up just a very quick point about um, how do you cope in such a long study with changes um, of that nature? It's uh, it's quite a challenge. I don't know that you need to answer that at the moment, but it certainly brings up that point. Ken, and hi, Ken, thank you, Robin, for that great question. And Ken has asked a question which leads to uh, very nicely to the first question that that uh, we thought we'd have asked, which was uh, restoration. Given you showed this wonderful map of how much Brigolo is uh, is left intact versus how much is is has been cleared, and all the problems that are related to that, uh, what's the picture with restoration? Um, yep. So, so <clears throat> um, some couple of quick answers to some of Ken's questions. Mm. So yes, mm. we did start under DPI in the 1960s and we were transitioned through DPI to DNR and then all the iterations of DNR through to resources and now into DESI. Um, so yes, we have done some biodiversity studies, but usually we we get other researchers to come and, and we invite them in to do that work. It's not our bag. Uh, however, vegetation is a little bit our bag. And so some of the work we're doing in restoration ecology there is to, um, to understand a little bit more about Brigolo itself. So Brigolo is primarily a vegetative reproducer. And so when you disturb the plant, it suckers furiously and sends up lots and lots of new trees from its root system. Uh, and as Alison pointed out in some discussions we had earlier, this was a bane for early settlers who were trying to develop this land. Um, this trait of the plant has me wondering about how many genetically distinct individuals do I see when I look at my virgin brigolo scrub catchment? Are all those trees genetically different individuals or due to suckering, are they all clones? If we were going to replant a brigolo woodland, what sort of genetic diversity would we be aiming for to replicate this system? Uh, to answer these questions, we've undertaken a study into the genetic diversity of Brigolo at the catchment study site and radially out from the study site to about 200 kilometres east-west and 300 kilometres north-south. We've got about 30 sites there and we're sampling individual trees to compare the DNA of trees within and between sampling locations. Um, the spatial study of genetic variability sounds highly scientific, but I think you'd get a really good laugh out of seeing us in the field. We use a giant modified slingshot to shoot line into the canopy to take leaf samples from the tops of mature trees. So it sounds scientific, but it's one of those things that in practice can be rather amusing. Yeah, and one of the other things that is related to restoration is is how long it is likely to take to redevelop an ecosystem or a community, start with the community um, of, of Brigolo if you are. Have you got any clues about, about that for a start, Craig? Yeah, so that was a question that early researchers in, um, in this area 
were interested in and they did some trials watching it regrow after clearing in the 60s and they got to about 50 years down the track and what they'd regrown didn't look anything like a mature Brigalow forest. So we approached it from a slightly different angle. The time to replace Brigalow uh, within a catchment, uh, a pretty good surrogate for that is going to be answering how old the trees are that are there already. So in order to answer that, um, we got in contact with Nathan English from CQU and Kwan Hua from ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Uh, we took some samples from dead trees, mature trees, and we aged the trees using radiocarbon dating and wiggle matching uh, along a radius from the centre of the trunk to the outside of the trunk. And using that technology and technique, we discovered that a mature remnant Brigalow tree lives to about 150 years old. And so this is really important information for restoration ecology to give us an understanding of how long it might take to restore the ecological function of these woodlands if we started replanting now or if we assisted natural regeneration towards maturity. And that actually feeds on to an extra part of Ken's comment there. He mm. made a comment about um, the pasture treatment looks to have regrowth, and that's very accurate, and that's very typical of uh, pastures in Brigalow lands. They continue to have Brigalow and other species grow through them, uh, and producers tend to come back through and engage in vegetation management via a number of techniques over time. So, yes, they do regrow, and there's an opportunity there to manage that regrowth to assist with broad scale revegetation. And no, there's absolutely no way Brigalow Belt Clearing would be allowed in the modern era. The Vegetation Management Act took care of that. It's it's interesting to to know in hindsight what was good and what was bad, but look at the production, the economic value of this area. So very not not an easy um, easy thing to think about in hindsight. Um, you've mentioned already a couple of studies that have been going on. Um, I believe you might have a few other complementary studies that uh, might be of interest. Absolutely. Uh, okay. um, so we focus very heavily on what we term the hill slope, so the catchments that we're working on, and we look at the soil and erosion within them. But we're also interested in how the sediment from our catchments move from the hill slopes into first and second order streams and then make their way down the catchment. Uh, we've got two pieces of work underway to help us answer those questions. Uh, the first is using cesium-137, a fallout radionuclide from atomic testing, and that's going to help us identify areas of erosion and deposition within the catchments. So we do that by comparing cesium activity in samples taken across the catchments in a grid pattern to those taken from uneroded, undisturbed locations at the head point of the control catchment. If we find less cesium at a site compared to the control samples, then the site's considered to have eroded, Whereas if we find more cesium, then deposition is thought to have occurred at the site. And similarly, we're using mm -hmm. OSL or optically stimulated luminescence to investigate the age of sediments deposited across the floodplain directly beneath the catchment study site and in in-stream deposits where water from the catchment study enters the river system itself. Uh, the working hypothesis at the moment is if the sediments all date to post-1950, so uh, immediately prior to the commencement of the land development scheme onwards, then the key driver of erosion is land clearing. Alternatively, if the sediments age as pre-1950, that tells us that the stream network is in fact very stable and it helps with our understanding of the primary sources of sediment within the catchment. Sounds very sensible. Um, Ray has put in a, Ray Andrews has popped in a question about fire and brigalow. Um, okay. And looking at your photos, it looked as though there was a bit of involvement there. That's right. So those photos you saw where you knock all the timber over and you leave the timber to sit, so the leaves dry and the bark dries, and then you set fire to it, that's the only way to get fire into a Brigalow community. Brigalow vegetation is naturally fire retardant. And when I turned up in this part of the world and I was told that and I looked at an environment that's got 
60 tonnes per hectare of standing, living, above-ground biomass, not including the shrub layer and not including the, um, the cover and woody debris on the surface, and, and got told that Brigalow landscapes don't burn. I thought that had to be absolute nonsense. Uh, however, I have seen it in practice, and talking with people um, on the Darling Downs who were in the areas of the Brigalow belt that were developed very early on where a lot of clearing was done by hand. Uh, Brigalow vegetation is very fire retardant and they would actually use it to their advantage in, um, in when they're using fire as a pasture management tool. They would pick a prevailing wind that was blowing towards the shade line of Brigalow scrub and they would happily burn their paddocks knowing that once the fire reached the, the timber line that the fire wouldn't continue through. Um, so yeah, it, it's a uh, you, that um, attribute of the vegetation is actually used as a management technique. And the reason for it is that unlike a eucalypt community, Brigolo isn't full of combustible oils and the like. So uh, the, the Blue Mountains uh, in New South Wales that get their name from the reflected haze of the, the eucalypt oils that, that cause the blue, we don't have that in Acacia harper filler woodlands. Um, that's not to say that other areas within the Brigalow Belt that actually do have eucalypts behave the same way. So they don't. Where the eucalypts are, then you'll see fire, but not, not in the Brigalow Belt itself. Ben's asked another question, which is, yeah, which is interesting because he's, talking of these remnants of, of, of extant Brigolo forest, is a study, has it, has it ended up being part of the largest remnant? If not, it's do you know the, the biggest It's the largest kind of remnant, remnant <laughs> that exists outside of the National Parks estate wow. is usually how we frame it. Um, there's a, another national park to the north. Uh, its name is Dipperoo, and it's in uh, it's near Nebo, so inland from Mackay. And uh, Dipperoo is one of the largest uh, remnants of mature Brigalow forest uh, on a land type where it grows to its full growth potential. So the trees you see up there are, are very large. They're growing on fertile vertisols, much like the catchment study. Um, to be honest, I haven't compared the size of the two, but they're probably they're probably similar. It really does beg you know, picking up on something you previously said that you're not responsible for biodiversity studies per se. But this remnant size is such an in, and connectivity between patches, et cetera, et cetera. It really does beg um, a decent fauna and similar study to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And the mm. Fitzroy Basin Association, so our, our local um, non-government catchment association, they have actually just kicked off a program looking at connectivity between patches and so they're looking at where regrowth exists and where stands of protected vegetation exist and if they were to go and do some planting how would they get the best bang for their buck in linking some of these areas up and so they're, they're putting some work in towards that and they're also putting some work in towards how would you actually regrow uh, Brigalow Acacia Harper filler and what would be the best techniques for that. Could I ask a quick question about that? I mean, you're talking about in the early days, and it was quite famous for this, that you had to go back several times to get rid of this regrowth. Is that sort of regrowth exhausted to a large extent? Have have we kind of managed to clear enough times that the assisted regeneration of, of the Brigolo patches isn't as possible as it might have been? 25, 30 years ago? If you have land that has been in long-term cultivation and this part of the year that's typically for dry land grain farming, usually wheat or sorghum, uh, decades of uh, ploughing, tillage and herbicide use has usually depleted the seed bank, not to zero, but to a very low number. Um, so where you do transition uh, old retired cropping land into pasture, the amount of tree regrowth you see is not enough that you would consider assisting that through as um, as uh, a remnant vegetation population in a grey system that's con that, that's always been grey since clearing. No, there seems to be 
somewhat unending supply. Uh, it's not all brigolo. There's a lot of casuarina and a lot of shrub layers as well. But certainly there's still um, a, a very large uh, seed bank. Hmm. So you can use that to some extent. Um, Robin's asked a very interesting um, question, and I rather liked your melon hole picture, by the way. Um, yes, what are the factors about undisturbed brigolo that reduce the run runoff so much? I mean, I've been working in rainforest, so, and and Melaleuca swamp, so I've got a bit of an answer to that myself. But I wonder what your answer might be. Um, okay, but so as opposed to buffalo pasture, which that's I right. think is quite interesting. Yep. So yeah, that's right. You'd look at a buffalo grass pasture and you'd think, wow, high cover, high biomass, that won't run off a lot of water. Uh, Physiologically, buffalo grass is a tropical grass and it loves our hot summers. It absolutely detests our cold winters. <clears throat> buffalo grass has a very low frost tolerance. And so uh, at a site where we can get many frosts throughout the winter, uh, by about the third frost of the year, you can destroy somewhere about 80% of the photosynthetic capability of buffalo grass. So its ability to use water uh, in winter after a frost is effectively zero. On the other hand, Brigolo is an absolute sponge. So uh, from, um, from our monitoring of soil and water, we have found that the same storm as in the rainfall intensity and total volume, we say a storm of 40 millimetres in winter versus 40 millimetres in summer, Brigolo has the capacity to capture and use that water in the same amount of time, irrespective of how hot it is or how cold it is. So when water is available in the landscape, Brigolo is so well adapted that it just sucks the whole lot up and it typically doesn't run off. And one of the things that is integral, is it is it actually the combination of the melon holes, for example, the actual structure of the Brigolo topography, microtopography that helps or and that's been smoothed out as well in the pastures, as Robin has suggested there, if I've translated that question correctly? Yep, there is some component to that. Um, but it's a small component compared to its ability to physically uptake the water out of the soil profile via its root system. Uh, what we don't know is whether it uh, transpires that water through the tree almost immediately or whether it in fact has mechanisms to store the water within the tree for future use in drier periods. So, And there are savanna trees that do both. You've got a, You've done your age. You should be able to get onto that water store biotic water storage quite quite well the age bit was pretty pretty special for many years it was extremely difficult in the subtropics and tropics to do that aging um now given we've already mentioned that biodiversity studies would be really good but there are other studies as well obviously but how is your situation with respect to visiting scientists and students and maybe even citizen scientists Absolutely. We, we love all those categories of people. So um, we work uh, at the moment, we have some ongoing work with uh, Griffith University with some PhD students there. Uh, we'd, and that work is based around um, hydrological modelling, flood modelling, and um, that they're also teeing in with some of our sediment transfer work. Uh, we're doing some work with the uh, University of Queensland. We have some uh, researchers there doing um, investigations on various pools of phosphorus in the soil that aren't the ones that we would typically capture with our normal soil testing. They're doing some work on sulphur and they've uh, used some of our um, sulphur samples, sorry, our soil samples, and they've taken them to the Oz synchrotron and they've been bombarding them and, and uh, looking at different um, forms of organic sulphur. Uh, we have a PhD student at the moment who's just starting his project and he's looking at woodland birds and, and the effects of patch size and um, connectivity between patches and those sorts of things. So um, there, there's some, some of the many, um, many activities that are externally happening on the site at the moment. Uh, one that is particularly of interest to, for me is uh, a gentleman by the name of Stuart McDonald. He's with CSIRO. 
and he's doing a study out there at the moment. I have Brigalow as one of his sites. He's looking at the ornamental snake, and the ornamental snake lives in cracking clay soils of the central Queensland part of the Brigalow belt, and they don't know a lot about it, and so they're doing some initial studies to look at abundance and, and movement within local sites over the years. So they've been out hand-catching nocturnal snakes that eat frogs and are found around melon holes. So for someone who does a lot of work around soil, water and vegetation, that's very different and <laughs> wildly exciting. Yeah, I'll say. Um, and... and um... Yes, I was just going to say, would they contact you, Craig? Um, you know, Absolutely. how would someone get to know? Yes. Yeah, okay. that, that's fine. Contact me yes. directly or uh, through the Brigolo Catchment Study website. Oh, yes, of course. That's that's also fine. Excellent. We're pushing on with time and we're, we've got a, quite a good question. Another question from Robin. I won't say another question, Robin. It's an excellent <sighs> question. Um, with the fire retardant nature, I mean, and, and, and it's interesting – um, a certain person in Tasmania who's a fire expert uh, or says he is, uh, DMJS Bowman, jumped up and down about Binnaburra and said, oh, you know, rainforest never burns. And, of course, if you've got any sense of history, you say, well, sorry about that, David. Um, but obviously, is it, you know, does Brigolo ever burn or is it partly because of this, um, the lack of grassy understory, asked Robin. Yep, I certainly wouldn't be so bold as to say it never burns. Um, I'm, I'm not not that brave, um, but absolutely, there is very little grass understory throughout. Um, most of the understory is um, uh, things like uh, Carissero vata or, or current bush, so small, shrubby, uh, very spiny. Um, very little fodder value for certainly for um, for grazing livestock, but um, about the only grazer we usually see in these environments are, um, are black striped wallabies, and uh, so they manage to eke out an existence on the very limited number of um, usually chlorous grasses that are in there. And one assumes they browse the wilgers and the current bushes and other such thing, because yes, there is there is very little. Um, other story that you would look at and say that would adequately carry a fire. And, okay, so remembering the economic value of the cleared areas, um, Neil Peach has asked an interest, a very interesting question about is there are there any potential commercial opportunities within the undisturbed Brigolo areas, you know, honey, for example? But... <laughs> Probably the biggest initial one is uh, ironically for a plant that reproduces vegetatively is the harvest of brigolo seed for reforestation work and so while the plant is predominantly a vegetative reproducer it does flower uh, it flowers in winter in wet years um, the, the triggers aren't entirely understood and it's not usual to see a a large block of brigolo all flowering at once, but certainly there'll be um, individual trees throughout a stand that will flower and they produce a viable seed. And that seed is worth a significant amount of money for uh, reforestation because it's unlike the other acacias, it's a soft seed. And so it doesn't require um, the breaking of dormancy by heat or smoke or anything like that. And in fact, it rots away and uh, is eaten by wildlife very, very quickly. Um, and uh, it's also eaten by the cockatoos and the other parrots while it's on the tree. So there's certainly a, an amount of money um, in, in seed production or seed harvesting. Uh, and the other area that we're just getting some understanding on is we've um, been trying to develop some relationships with uh, traditional owner groups. And it's very, very early days for us, but the people we have had out on site have been pointing out to us the bush tucker sources within uh, the Brigolo Belt. And they've been showing us uh, particular tree saps and um, and ruby salt bush uh, is another one where the, um, the, the fruits are, are quite edible. And so there are certainly um, opportunities perhaps in, in that bush tucker space, or it's certainly worth investigating. And um, 
when I was uh, touring around the Northern Territory, looking at some of the magnificent sites out there, I actually met a gentleman who is working with similar groups in that part of the world, and they're looking at um, wattle seed for human consumption, and they have used the uh, the branding uh, company name of Wattle We Eat, which I thought was wonderful. Joan and Alan Cribb would be very proud of the wattle seed bizzo. That was one of their the recipes that they put in their bush foods book years ago. And no, yes, no doubt they'd learnt it from, from the local communities. Um, I suppose we're, we've got about, ten, about nine minutes to go, Craig. Um, and, of course, we've got this International Rangelands Congress coming up. And one of the reasons why I'm interested in that and this study is, I suppose, we do these things that um, are locally of, of concern and interest, um, and and you've mentioned even within Australia, this particular study is important um, across a wide wide swathe of Australia. But what do you think? Um, are there any research areas? in your study that have been world firsts? Okay. Um, so we have some world firsts. Um, when the reef plan work uh, commenced in the late 2000s, there was a lot of interest around what are known as photosystem two herbicides. And um, that's the mechanism of action of the herbicide in the plant. But because seagrass uh, is also um, susceptible to the exact same mode of action of these herbicides as a normal grass, a terrestrial plant. So there was concern about um, how those chemicals behave in the marine environment, but how they get there as well. Uh, in the grazing environment, um, the most common photosystem two herbicide is a chemical called tibithyron, uh, and the trade name of that is grassland is the most common one. And so grassland is distributed from uh, planes and helicopters via pellets um, and over large areas of uh, grazed pasture in the Briglow Belt for the control of regrowth. Uh, and very little was known about the fate of that chemical at the catchment scale. And so we did some work that was published in 2016 where we went to our conservative grazing catchment and we actually applied the herbicide uh, out of a plane as you would do in a commercial situation. And we monitored uh, how it was lost from the paddock in runoff and how its concentrations declined over time in runoff and in soil and what the drivers of that were. Um, <clears throat> the key takeaway for us there was we found tebithyron in our water samples in quite substantial amounts up to 1,200 days after application. So it was very persistent and very soluble in water and that was its mode of action. So that was one of the world firsts. Uh, the other one is um, in association with the work we're doing around sediment loss. We know that within creeks and river systems, the very fine clay fraction of particles, so less than four microns in size, they're the ones that move with ease through our river systems and then migrate out through the marine environment. Um, and so we're interested in how that fine fraction comes off the paddock and whether what we see in our eroded material, that's the, the main contributor or if it's a small contribution. Um, when we do a test for particle size analysis, we do that in a laboratory and we usually do it on a discrete water sample. And the results we get aren't particularly well correlated back to a physical process in the landscape. It's more of an understanding of about the properties of the actual parent soil itself. So to try and get around that, we've taken a, um, an instrument called a LIST. So that's a real-time laser diffusion particle size scanner. And we have mounted those in the flumes at Brigalow. And as far as we can tell, we're the first people in the world silly enough to go and mount such an instrument in a flume and actually try and use it to measure real-time particle size in runoff as it leaves the paddock. And hopefully that'll tell us a little bit more about whether the eroded material is leaving the paddock or at that hill slope scale as the fine clay fraction that's going to travel right through the, uh, the stream system, or if it's leaving in larger aggregated particles, or if there's differences between land use or management. So that might give us some clues on the best way to manage 
uh, our grazing lands to improve the retention of the fine clay fraction on the paddock where it should be. Now I'm going to take you up a little bit to a higher level of innovativeness and 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 uh, originalness um, in in the global state in the country and global scale, namely paired catchments, paired catchment studies in agricultural areas that have been maintained for sixty years. I would suggest are pretty rare, um, and heads heads hats off to the various Queensland government departments that you've mentioned the changes in, um, but that persistence to maintain it, um, to maintain such a study, it's not easy. And how have you come across many other such paired catchment studies? Not obviously not in Rigolo, but of this nature around the world that you could say, you know, this is my buddy. There are others around. Um, the United States holds uh, probably the um, the largest cohort of those mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trick with paired catchment studies or the novelty for Brigolo is that most paired catchment studies were usually looking at a management intervention. Most of them had yes. a, um, a history from forestry and mm -hmm. they were looking at um, pre or post clearing or various levels of clearing or uh, different forms of removal of logs from the actual forest coops mm -hmm. out to um, to logging stages and, and things like that. Brigolo fits the niche of being a study that actually looks at land use, not just land management. Mm -hmm. So it's got the, um, the fence line comparisons with the calibration back to how the landscape uh, originally behaved. So we, we do have other paired catchment studies in Australia. There are a number of forestry ones uh, through Victoria. There's some um, unreplicated studies in New South Wales. There's some in Western Australia. Uh, the, they, they tend to come and go um, because of the long-term nature of them. Uh, people move on in their careers, funding uh, dries up. There's a change in, in direction of the host organisation. So lots of them have folded over the years. Yes, I've, I know with many of the forestry ones, they've, there are obviously obvious changes in forest industry. Um, they've folded, for example, and they were some of the best exemplars. And they're also... Some of them kind of stop and start <laughs> with, with That's very true. current enthusiasms of governments or whatever. Um, I think that is about it for the questions in the chat. And there's anyone else has a question to pop in. Um, but oh, excellent briefing. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> I would concur with Michael's comment. Um, Craig, it's I've been enjoying very much um, in a little preparation time, uh, people in the audience, but also here seeing those wonderful photographs, but particularly hearing your your discussion and exp ex exposition of all the amazing things you've been doing. So thank you, Craig. And thank um, you very much. Thank you too. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I think we might. Call it, a, call it a day. I'm half expecting that um, John will come back. But, yes, he is. Here he is. Bang on schedule. <laughs> no, Bang on Alison, schedule. Alison, Craig, uh, on behalf of everyone on the call, I would very much like to thank you both. It's been a fascinating discussion this evening, and I'm sure we've all learned more than we were expecting. So thank you yes. both. Thank you to everyone online. We'll see you again for another RGSQ event Thanks. very soon. Thanks.